Good morning, my name is Billy Bailey, Park Service Specialist at the Florida Caravan State Park. I believe I met most all of you uh, just a few days ago at our nature walk that we did out there. Well today I'm doing a presentation for you with some of the natural and cultural resources of the Florida Caravan State Park. Uh, it's easy to take you all out to the park and walk on the trail. You see a few things, but there's a lot of stuff that you don't see. And uh, so what I've done today is try to compile some of the neat things about the Florida Caverns Park into items that you can see. And um, my daughter Leah has come in to help me today, and she's going to walk around with some of these things so that you can see them up close. And I'll pretty much go from one end to the other. This is part of an exhibit that we do at the park. Uh, we do it for school groups. Uh, about 10,000 school children a year come to the Florida Caverns, and this is part of programs that we do for them. And uh, so I bought a portion of our program I'm to do with you today. And uh, some of these things are good to pass around, they're good to hold. Um, I'll get started on this end down here. This is a uh, snake skin. This is from the Southern Black Racers, very common snake. Uh, uh, they're a real shiny black color, very common. We have about 45 species of snake in Florida. And anybody know how many of these snakes are venomous? How many venomous snake species are in Florida? Anybody know? Six. We have the, uh, the cotton mouth, the coral snake, the copperhead, and the three rattlesnakes. So of those, about four are found within this area. And the other 39 uh, species of snake in Florida, native species, are, are non venomous, meaning that uh, uh, they can hurt you there. But this is one of the common ones you'll see in this area. They like to lay out in sunny spots and they can't regulate their own body temperature very well, so they rely on getting that sunlight to maintain a, a relatively constant body temperature there. So. You know, we know why snakes shed their skin, right? That's something we learned when we were little, but sometimes we don't think about it as adults. They, they shed their skin because they don't have fingernails or hair. We release dead skin cells from our body through the production of fingernails and, and hair. Uh, well, we grow our fingernails out, we grow our hair, but the snakes, they don't have this. And so as they grow, the outer layer of skin cells, they die out and they shed them in one solid time, just like this. And the rattlesnake is known for that very last little bit of skin folds over and forms a rattle. And that's how the rattlesnakes actually grow rattles as they go there, is that uh, the dead skin cells uh, building over, folding up and hardening into a rattle there. Put that as the snake skin there. And this is something that's kind of cool. This is, this is the, the backbone of a snake here. And you can see how many ribs they have. They're pretty much ribs throughout the whole body. They have lots and lots and lots of ribs. And after our program, you can be more than welcome to come up here and look at individual things to see them a little bit closer. This is something we'll pass around. You want to uh, walk over and hand it to her and they can just pass it around and then bring it back up here at the end there. And that's uh, just a replica from an interpretive uh, company called Acorn Naturalist uh, with raccoon hair so you can kind of see what it feels like with a you know, raccoon running around the classroom. And uh, here's some turtle shells. This is the eastern box turtle. This is one uh, shell was found here and I uh, polyurethaned it to kind of preserve it. And this is one that's found in the woods after a few years of being out there. Uh, turtle Anatomy 101, the top part, part is called the carapace. The bottom part is called the plastron, the carapace and the plastron. And something neat about box turtles, each one of these individual squares on its carapace is called a scute, S-C-U-T-E. And just like with the rings of a tree, you can count the rings and tell how old it is. The same is true with a box turtle. You can get a good idea of how old a box turtle is by counting those rings there. Each one of those rings represents a year there. Uh, you can tell how far apart they are, how much they grew that year, closer together, didn't grow as much there. And then the, the really light colored one is one that was in the forest for quite a while and got bleached. And you can see where squirrels uh, chewed along the edges of it there. During the summertime, squirrels will find turtle shells and deer antlers and they will chew on those to keep those teeth worn down. Where uh, during the winter months, they have acorns and hickory nuts and walnuts, but during the summer months, they don't have that. So you'll find a lot they go with. Uh, turtle shells and deer antlers to keep those teeth worn down and also a source of protein and calcium. Here's another shell here. This is from the Swanee River turtle. This is an aquatic species. And that's the male. The female is about twice that size because she has to be able to hold a clutch of maybe 30 or 40 eggs at one time. So she's a lot bigger. Uh, that's the male there. It's a Swanee River turtle. 
Um, at one time they were pretty common here, but they're listed, listed as a threatened species now due to habitat loss and uh, just not a lot of those. When you do see them, there's a few in the Chipola River, but they're more common in the Apalachicola and Chattahoochee River. Right there. Come around right here. And this is something really neat. Uh, this is a bat skull. See how small this is? Just about the size of a thumbnail there. That's from the little brown bat. We have about 17 types of bats that live in Florida, and only about three actually use caves. So most bats actually sleep in tree hollows, Spanish moss, and things like that. Uh, but a few do use the, uh, the caves of the park. We have one cave that's used by a pretty large colony of southeastern bats, but we find the tour cave is the tricolored bat. It's a non-colonial species. You find one or two at a time. But that's kind of a neat uh, idea to show you how small that they actually are. That's a really small bat, the little brown one. They get a little bit bigger than that, but even the big one, like the big brown bat or the pretail bat, they're only about that tall when you find one that's sleeping, but when they open their wings about that wide, you think they're a little bigger than they are. Very beneficial animals. It's estimated the population of bats in this county consumes about a quarter of a million pounds of mosquitoes a year. So they can't get them all, but they help. About these. Any idea what that would be? It's from a fish. It's from a gar. That's from a gar fish. This, uh, these are two different types of gar. That's the short nose and the long nose here. Uh, there's three or four types of gar. There's the alligator gar, the short nose, the long nose, there's the spotted. There's a few different types of uh, gar there. But that's part of the rostrum or the bill there. And here's some neat tracks. Uh, I won't pass these around. You guys can check these out after the program if you like there. But it's some molds of what animal tracks look like. And I did bring some identification cards for animal tracks if you're curious. Uh, uh, get with me after the uh, program. I'll be glad to give you some of those cards if you'd like to know more about animal tracks and how to identify them. And um, I'll pass this one around. This is actually a replica here of a possum there. This is the Virginia uh, possum there. Uh, possums are really neat animals. It's an animal you see a lot. You don't think much about it. We take it for granted because we see them all the time. But some really cool facts uh, about possums they actually uh, hold the record for the shortest gestation period of any mammal on earth. From conception to birth is two weeks. Okay. When the babies are born, they're about the size of a uh, little honeybee, or uh, maybe a couple of grains of rice. They're very, very small. And when they're born, they stay inside the mom's pouch there. And when they get to be a couple weeks old, they'll start to crawl out and they'll go around on her back. And for two or three weeks, or maybe a little bit longer, they will ride around on her back there. And they'll she'll teach them how to hunt. And in the wild, in the wild, they eat a lot of insects. They're mostly insectivorous, but you can look at their teeth and you can tell that they're really set up to eat pretty much anything there. You'll see that the brain casing on the possum there is considerably smaller than the raccoon there. So you see the raccoon has a much larger brain than the possum does. Uh, possum is North America's only marsupial. Um, the opossa was uh, John Smith's translation of the Native Americans describing uh, the Virginia opossum, and that's where the common name opossum comes from, was opossa, which was uh, John Smith describing how the Native Americans were calling it, and I believe it translates to like white tree animal or something like that. It's got the word white, but opossa is where opossum comes from there. Let's see. Let's pass this, this one around there. You won't find uh, this very often in the wild in the forest there. This was comes. This is a replica from a company there. This is uh, the red shoulder hawk here. You can see the the beak there. It's a falcon, predatory bird we have in this area. Let's see. How about this one? Yeah, I got one in the case. So pass that one around there. Same thing. This is the armadillo. If you look at the armadillo, you'll see that it has the long, skinny nose there, and that's actually a little bit flexible. It's a little bit cartilaginous there, especially towards the tip. And that's because it's, a, it's in an anteater family. Armadillo is basically a type of anteater. And if you look at the, uh, the face there, you can see the similarity. 
And uh, they have that flexible nose so that they can uh, dig holes and find burrowing uh, insects. They eat a lot of ants, termites there. The good um, armadillos in their native habitat of South America are a keystone species. Many different types of animal use an armadillo burrow in South America, kind of like the gopher tortoise that we have here. It's a keystone species. Lots of animals live in a burrow and use it for habitat. In South America, that's its niche. Unfortunately, in the 1950s, the armadillo was introduced into the United States. About the same time, it was introduced into South Florida and Texas. And around 1973, 1975, right in there, these populations met in the Florida Panhandle. So believe it or not, the armadillo that we know today was not found in the Florida Panhandle until about 1973. So a lot of people necessarily remember when there were no armadillos. They remember when they came in. Uh, they were introduced accidentally as a lot of invasive animals are. And what makes it invasive is that it displaces native animals. Uh, it digs up bird's nest, or it digs up a turtle's nest with the eggs. It uh, disrupts the nest of ground roosting birds. It's a lot of native insects. And it has no natural predators here. In South America, it's kept in check by predators and disease. Well, when you take an animal from one country and put it in the other, and it doesn't have a population check like it would in South America, the population explodes. And it's at an unnatural proportion. And to top that off, um, did you know that armadillos have identical quadruplets? Every time an armadillo has, gives birth, it's identical quadruplets. It's four boys or four girls, always. If you ever find baby armadillos around, you will generally find four. They stay together for a little while uh, after they leave mom and, and uh, root on. They uh, dig burrows. Most of, the burrows you, most of the holes you find in the ground are from an armadillo. We do have gophers here in the uphill uh, sandy habitats, but the armadillo is found pretty much anywhere that doesn't go underwater, you'll find an armadillo there. Very, very common in this area. Uh, so the bad is they're invasive. The good thing is they eat fire ants there. So. Fire ants are also an invasive uh, insect species that was introduced here. They're not native to the area, and the armadillo actually digs them up and eats them. Uh, so that's a good thing. They also dig up uh, yellow jacket nests. Yellow jackets, if you were to, if you were uh, ran over an or a uh, yellow jacket nest with a mower, you probably learned all about yellow jackets there. But uh, they, if you were to dig up that hole there, it would look something like this down in the ground there, where they raise the young, have the eggs, and, um, and the young come out there. But armadillos will actually dig up yellow jacket nests there. So a couple of, couple of goods, but they are an invasive exotic animal in uh, all, pretty much all um, public land in Florida that's managed uh, removes armadillos in some capacity or makes an attempt to. They're, they're uh, pretty bad for our environment. What else we got here? I will pass this one around. It's really small. You can walk up afterwards and see it if you like. But this is a skunk. Did you know we have skunks here? They're pretty rare. There's not many around anymore in most habitats, and some actually attribute that to the armadillos because they have the same habitat, the same diet, same mannerisms. Everything's pretty much the same with how a skunk and armadillo carry out their lives, so some mammalogists theorize that the armadillo displaced the skunk in the ecosystem. Uh, not sure, but uh, we do have skunks here. They're not very common. Washington County has a population around uh, Fallen Water State Park. You can still see one every once in a while there. I think I've seen two in the past 15 years here. They're pretty rare, but they are still around. You'll see a little bit more of a population around uh, the State Park Road there. And I mentioned with, uh, when I compared the opossum there, this is the raccoon here. It's that masked bandit that comes in the night and gets in the, in the garbage there. That's the raccoon. There's a difference in the, the skull of the, the male and the female there. Uh, the male has kind of the peace sign there, and the female has the two lateral lines there. So it's a little bit different in the, in the skull there for what it's worth. Let's see. And uh, the Virginia white-tailed deer, something we see, I saw a few on the way over here, pretty common in this area. That's the doe, the female there. Anybody want to guess what this one is? Oink, oink. That's a pig. Uh, this is a feral, feral pig. Feral means it's uh, not wild. Originally, it's introduced here. It's another invasive exotic animal. They were introduced in 
Some say the 16th, some say the 17th century, but they were introduced initially by the Spanish, by the Europeans coming into Florida there. And the population that thrived, and of course, you have people that uh, the farm pigs, and some have gotten out, some have been released, and some populations have combined. And so at this point now, you find uh, hogs in a lot of natural communities, including state parks, uh, Blue Springs uh, County Parks, got a lot of them there. And you'll see them all colors now, which shows you they've kind of uh, mixed with uh, the farm-raised pigs now. But they're another invasive exotic, which means they don't have much for a natural predator. They do well in the wild here and they disrupt a lot of native ecosystems there. That's what makes them invasive. Now see, we talk about the, how to tell the age of a tree. You pretty much either pick the light color or the dark colored rings, and you count them, and each ring represents a year. The wider the ring, the more it grew. The narrow, the less it grew that year. And uh, aging a tree is called dendrochronology. There, it just literally translates to aging a tree there. Um. Sure. With each line, does it represent like a day or a month of mm -hmm. how much it grew that time? Uh, each line represents a year. Okay. Uh, you have the dark and the light color, which represent the summer and the winter. So basically, a tree puts on two rings each year, a light colored ring and a dark ring, one for each seed, one for the winter, one for the summer, basically, during the dormant and the growing season, as it's uh, often called forest management there. So you pick either the light or the dark, and you count them there. So. Uh, that tells you this was somewhere around a 20, 25 year old tree, something like that. And this piece is often called a cookie there. This came from uh, Mark Hill, uh, who was a division uh, director of forestry in this area. Actually, not in this area, he retired and moved to this area. Let's see what else we got here. This is a lichen. So you have two types of lichen. You have fil filamentous and crutose lichen. This would be the filamentous. You find this in dry uh, habitats typically. You find them a lot in association with pine trees, sandy, usually at 120 uh, foot elevation or more here. And uh, a lichen is a symbiotic relationship between a fungus and algae. And uh, Dr. Kucha can probably elaborate a lot more than uh, I can on that. But uh, one provides, provides protection from the elements, the other undergoes photosynthesis to produce the sugar there, and they help one another thrive. But those patches that you see on trees that are green or red or orange, and those are, uh, that's the, um, the, the uh, crutos like in there, and this would be the filamentose that grows on the ground. And uh, a feather from a barred owl here. Pass that around. Something neat about the owl feathers is along the edge, the feather is tapered out a little bit. It's a little bit different than a lot of birds. Instead of the each of the, the strands on the feather being stuck completely together, they're actually separated a little bit. They're feathered out there. And what that does is quietens um, the, the flapping of the wings. So as the owl is descending down to grab a mouse or something, it actually uh, it doesn't make as much noise as a lot of birds would by having that specially adapted uh, feathering on the edge of the feathers there. You ever see the pictures of the of Native Americans with a feather on the side of the head right there? I've been told that that was uh, Native Americans would do that to his, uh, they would believe that uh, it, was, it would help them with hunting there. If an owl could sneak and swoop down and grab something there, they would kind of help them as a hunter. So it was kind of a tradition of hunting to wear the feathers there to be more stealthy there. Uh, let's see, I think we went out of this. Now this one is actually uh, inside of a hornet's nest, not a yellow jacket nest, but I was showing you that they're very similar in appearance. The hornet nest is the one that has the big, uh, it's round, you find them up in the trees there. And it has layers and layers of basically paper. Um, they, these are all examples of uh, types of paper wasp, and that common paper wasp refers to they can actually make paper there. So long before the Egyptians were doing it, uh, many of these wasps actually were making their own paper there. So this is from the hornet. I said it would have sheets and sheets of gray paper around it there. But this is the chambers inside where it lays its eggs there and covers them and raises them. And a couple of examples. This is the one you're probably more familiar with. This is the red wasp. This is the one you find up on the eve of the house. If you ever spend much time on the Chipotle River, you know to look out for these. You have to, if you hit, the, hit that tree limb with your boat or your canoe, you'll probably end up in the water there. But that's the red wasp there. And this is another inside uh, 
a hornet nest a little bit bigger set up there. Yeah, a couple of cool things there. This is a rhinoceros beetle. There, it's called Hercules beetle. You hear it called both. There's, there's a little bit of difference in species there, but a lot of times the name uh, is interchangeable there. But the rhinoceros beetle, you see, because it's appearance, it has those big horns there that helps it to move things around. It's called rhinoceros beetle, or the uh, uh, Hercules beetle, because they're so strong and comparative, they can uh, move and lift many times their own weight there. So. One of the biggest beetles that we have here. <laughs> This is something cool. We see these all the time, and a lot of times you'll hear them called locusts there. That's just a, a misnomer that was applied there. These are not locusts. Locusts are in the grasshopper uh, family. They basically look like grasshoppers there. These are cicadas there. But the name gets interchanged with them because uh, cicadas will form plagues as locusts, and so that plague got misapplied there. But these are cicadas. Uh, here we have periodical and annual cicadas. We have Cicadas that uh, will come out every year, some species every year you'll have emergence of cicadas. And then some species come out every so often. Uh, I think we're at an intergrade zone here. You have like 7 years, 13 years, 19 years. You have different cycles of cicadas. And I think we're on an intergrade zone where we have a couple of different emergencies, emergences here. But something that's really neat is cicada lays the egg, the egg is in the ground, it hatches, it goes into uh, essentially a larval stage that looks like this. Now in some instances this can remain in the ground feeding on detritus, the nutrients from the, from the roots and the soil for in some instances 17 years. So 17 years this remains underground but what is miraculous is the emergence. At one point in 17 years Hundreds of thousands, if not millions, of these can emerge in an area at the same time. So that, that's that's mind blowing. How do they all know to come out at the same time? Is it a circadian rhythm? Is it a, is a temperature? But how do they know? I mean, how do they know how many seasons to go through there? So that's something really neat. In our age of technology, with with uh, with calling and with texting, and just how fast can you get a message from me to somebody over there instantly? But think about that. For long, long before we had that technology, this insect was able to communicate and to, to uh, basically come up with a plan and all come out at the same time there. So that's something that's really, really neat and that's not truly understood how they all know to come out at the same time. Like I said, there's many instances you have periodical, you have uh, annual, and then you have intergrade zones where you have uh, multiple emergences here. But when it's time to come out, they crawl out, go up on a tree, and this is the familiar exoskeleton that you can find on the pine trees right here around campus there. And then it undergoes essentially metamorphosis and grows wings and comes out as this guy. And we've got said we probably got eight or ten different types of cicadas in Florida there. But that's what it looks like when it comes out. And they have a very high pitched shrill call and sometimes it's almost deafening in the summertime and you can hear them all in the tree going on at the same time there. So that's something that's really neat. What else we got? Let me pass this around. That is a periwinkle snail. Um, if you fish much you know what a shell cracker is. A shell cracker is a type of sunfish. It gets the common name shell cracker because that's primarily what it eats, the periwinkle snail. That's specific one, I believe it's an Illuminia genus, uh, is found only in the Blue Hole swimming area of the Caverns Park. It's never been found anywhere else, so it's such an endemic species, it's known just from that area right there. So that's the periwinkle snail. All right, let's see what we got. This is a mussel shell. At one time, we had uh, mussels this size in Chipola River. I think there's a couple of tops still in the Apalachicola River to get this large, but not in the Chipola. Native Americans use these for tools. Well, you know, you can come up with many uses of this, scooping out uh, burnt out logs to make dugout canoes there. So lots and lots of uses of ready made tool there. All right, so we got on time. Let's sort of transition to some, some of this other stuff here. Let's see. And that's the tooth from that boar, that air cell, rather. Got some fossils here, so we kind of jump to that. Um, 
I think when we did the nature walk, remember we passed the Tonic Cave, we talked a little bit about limestone and what limestone is. It's basically compressed, dried out ocean mud. And within that you find fossils like this one. Uh, I probably passed this one around, it's pretty, pretty fragile. But that's a sand dollar. That's a sand dollar that's found fossilized here in this limestone. And then around it you have all sorts of other little fossils. Most of these are uh, called forams, short for foraminifera. Uh, unicellular organisms that are found within limestone and are often used to date limestone, uh, which particular layer it is, a process known as biostratigraphy. Stratigraphy. Let's pass this around. This, these two, this is cool. These are two different types of sea urchins that are found fossilized here, two different ages of limestone here. We have the Mariana Swanee and Ocala layers of limestone here, collectively known as the Bump Nose Formation. Uh, about a piece of a mastodon tooth. You know right where this campus is, there used to be elephants? Right here. We don't think about that, but uh, especially right here with our proximity to the Chipola River, uh, we, there were lots and lots of animals that would have came down here, uh, especially the mastodons and mammoths there. It's hard to imagine, but we had uh, basically elephants here. They're all with the proboscideans, I think is what they, uh, they call them, so essentially elephants here. Uh, we also had uh, bison, saber-toothed cat, smilodon, uh, saber-toothed cat, uh, short-faced bear, glyptodont, which is like an armadillo the size of a Volkswagen car. So a lot of cool animals once uh, lived here. Uh, that was found uh, back in the 60s by a uh, diver here on the Chipola River. So actually came from the river right here. Uh, this came from the Chipola River as well. This is called a root cast. This is basically where a tree root grew, grew down into the limestone over time, um, it died, decayed, and then that void was filled with uh, other deposits, sand and clay, hence the little pieces of sandstone in it. That's that round, that's a root cast. Oh, I'm sorry. Fossilized wood. All right, now for the cool stuff. This is from a megalodon. Um, we talked about the limestone a little bit. In the superficial layer of the limestone here, you can find these giant shark teeth here. Believe it or not, they get a lot bigger than this. This would have been not a juvenile, but would have been a young megalodon here. The Carcal megalodon was a shark that lived in this area long before there was a river here. This was when this was covered by a warm, shallow sea. This shark that got up to potentially 50 feet long swam these waters here. A big one would be about that big, about two hand size. They get up over, find them over six inches. I've seen them the size of two hands that come out of the Chipola River here. So this is a smaller one here, but still compared to our modern day sharks, it's a pretty substantial size shark tooth there. And a couple others that you can check out if you like afterwards. Okay, well we're gonna say transition a little bit here. This is where lightning struck the sand and basically turned it into glass. See where the lightning bolt came in and then came out there. So it's kind of neat. Just natural glass. <coughs> well, we'll get into the cultural side of it. Um, Native Americans used the area that's known as Florida Cavern State Park for some say as far as 10,000 years. The, uh, the Paleo Indians that were coming through this area would uh, looks for this large game like these mastodonts and mammoths and uh, buffalo along the Chipola River here. They sought shelter in the caves in what's now the Florida Cavern State Park. And then uh, later over time, as they became less nomadic, they formed uh, settlements and villages. There is 35, 36 archaeological sites in the Florida Cavern State Park. And many of these are caves that were used by Native Americans. Uh, the, we walked uh, the bluff trail there. You saw several of those caves that were used. And uh, here's some Fort Walton period pottery. I won't pass this around, but you can check it out afterwards if you like here. But remember we talked about the Native Americans would go into the caverns and they would gather clay out of these caves and they would use it to make this pottery. And here's some examples of that pottery with the incision or the designs on it. And they use these pottery vessels for transporting water in, uh, fruit, berries, nuts. And they also they weren't able to put a pottery vessel over a fire because it would, it would break, but they used what they called cooking stones, where they would take uh, 
quartz cobble, river rock, sandstone, pieces like that, and they would put that over the fire, in the fire, until it got red hot. Then they would drop these hot rocks into a pottery vessel of water, and that's how they would heat water. So, examples of pottery here. A uh, small little uh, pestle and mortar here. A lot of times the, uh, the bottom part would be a bit bigger so they could do more, but this is just kind of for example here. Uh, we use, a, you know, there's a pestle and mortar available now, people still use, but Native Americans would use this to crush up acorns to make uh, uh, basically a bread with, a, you know, crush up hickory nuts. They also made what they called nutting stones, which would be a stone that would have one divot in it, the size of an acorn, the size of a hickory nut, the size of a walnut, and they would crack it with another one, and that would prevent everything from going everywhere. It would just open it up there. That's an example of a pestle and mortar. This is a billet stone that's uh, made out of fossilized coral. A uh, billet stone is part of the flint knapping process. They would take, uh, the first part would be spalling. They would find a vein of flint along the Chipola River, along a spring in a cave. Uh, flint is just a, a harder type of rock found within limestone. It's basically, it's a higher uh, density of silica. It's basically got more sand that's turned to glass over time inside of it. And they would take a hammer stone bust a chunk of that out and have a piece, you know, maybe that big, and that's called spalling. Then the next step they would take that back to camp, and a lot of times they would shape it into a cast or a preform, you know, something about like that there. It's the size it can be worked into two or three different things, or, or more if you want smaller with it. And then they could use that um, almost like currency, you know, it's a potential to, to uh, make a lot of different things out of it. And uh, then the next step of that, they would take what they call a billet stone, which would be a deer antler. In this case, it's fossilized coral that they shaped and used as a billet stone. And if you look closely, you see the little star patterns in it. Those are coral polyps that you're actually seeing in there. And then they would use a smaller uh, billet stone for the percussion flaking or the finalized flaking. And that's the process of uh, making a tool or a weapon here. I'll pass them all around. I'll pass them all around. Okay. This would be possibly a spear point, but a lot of times a spear point also doubled as a knife. There, it's easy to call everything an arrowhead, and we have a tendency to basically call anything that's kind of pointed like that an arrowhead. But in actuality, an arrowhead, most arrowheads were you know, small. They were very small like this. What we like, often call bird points were arrowheads. They used those with a bow and arrow. I remember for about 8,000 years they didn't use bow and arrows, they used spears uh, thrown by something called an atlatl to propel it there. And something this size or this size may have been on the end of a spear. But things like this, way too big to be shot out of a bow and arrow. It would never even have made it to the animal before it hit the ground there. So these were on the tip of spears, uh, propelled by a handheld hand -held tool about that big called an atlatl there. And they also served as knives. The only difference really in a spear point and knife most of the time is a handle there. A long handle would be a spear, or they would put on a short handle, and that would serve as a knife there. So, spear point and knife a lot of times is interchangeable, and the same uh, piece would serve uh, both functions there. Let's see. Let's pass these three around together. A couple of different knives, five spear points. This is actually a uh, spear point or a knife here that broke and they reshaped it into a scraper there. Pretty much anything you can find in a shop, anything you can find in the kitchen, the Native Americans had some version of it. Uh, and this would pretty much be um, a knife, uh, something you think of like a scraper, something that you would use as a tool to scrape, remove, glue, paint, or thing like that. This would have been more along the lines of probably either on a small handle for skinning a deer or it could have been used for scraping uh, the bark off of uh, a tree limb to use for a tool or a weapon or something. Here you go. Pass this through. Just, just be careful with those. And I have a few other examples here of some tools there. Come on, this one too. This would be a scraper. Leah actually found this one here. But uh, this would be a scraper here that they would use for uh, a larger animal. You have all different sizes. I mean, you wouldn't use the same tool to uh, to uh, uh, clean a squirrel as you would a mastodont. I mean, so they had a variety. Anything from uh, thumbnail size up to hand size were used. So here's a, a bigger one there. 
and that was been heat treated there, you can tell by that. A lot of times they would put a piece of rock in the coals of a fire to heat it up, and it basically compressed or made the silica, the sand of the rock, uh, uh, easier to work and flake better, it separated better. And a lot of times they would store uh, arrowheads or knives or something in sand because it preserved them. And so what people call a cache, a collection of artifacts, is a lot of times where they store it in the ground to preserve it in the sand or to hide it. We've got all kinds of little scrapers here. You can check that out at the fact if you like there. Uh, a few more shark teeth here. I thought this was cool. This is a modern day alligator. This one would be about six or eight feet. Of course, it gets a little bit bigger than that. Sure. And the one that Leah has is an al Sorry. Well, was a, an alligator tooth uh, from an alligator we had here at one time that would have been uh, 15, 20 feet long, a really, really big one that we don't have anymore. Prehistoric horses there. We had, up until the end of the last ice age, we had over 20 different types of uh, prehistoric horse, or 20 different types of horse that lived here in Florida. And at the last ice age, they all pretty much disappeared. But uh, pass these around here. I didn't start getting that stuff in brand new. Basically a hand axe or uh, something that we, the Indians would use for busting bone. A lot of times you'll find these associated with what they call kill sites or uh, sites near water where Native Americans would uh, bust open the bones of these large animals like this mastodonts for the marrow. Uh, <coughs> mastodont rib bone. This is um, maybe a necklace or a pendant. The Native Americans uh, drill a hole in this to wear it as a necklace. Probably could have been used as a, a weight for fishing as well. Here, maybe serve a couple of purposes. Let's see, a little fast forward a little bit in history here. This is a piece of a turpentine pot. Turpentine was uh, a huge industry in this area where you have the tall stands of these long leaf pine trees. And turpentine basically is the sap produced by a pine tree. And uh, the people, it was real big, especially in the, 19, 19 teen, the teens, the 1920s there, and they would basically cut a hole, a little hole in a pine tree, and put a, uh, this pot under it on a little shelf there, and this pot was used to collect this. And it was used in uh, naval stores, and uh, they would use this basically natural glue to seal the cracks in between the boards of wooden boats there. So when boats were made out of wood, they would use a sap of pine trees to seal between the boards, basically to make them waterproof. Uh, this is a piece of coal. This is from the Penn Railroad. In 1900, there was a railroad built to bring logs uh, from the upper Chipola to a mill down where uh, South Street is now. There was a huge lumber mill operating there and that was, a, that was a big big industry here and they basically cut a lot of the big trees on the upper Chipola River floodplain area there and they sent them down by steam powered locomotive and this is coal from that so the, from the Penn Railroad it operated from 1900 to 1930 in this area and it's a spike from that, from that railroad so that's a, almost a 120 year old railroad spike there Got here. Llama. We had llamas here at one time. It's hard to imagine the animals we had here at one time. There have been lion, American lion skulls found in the Chipola River. That's amazing. We had a lot of weird animals here. We definitely don't associate with what we know today for animals, but that's from a llama. They call it a llama like animal, but let's get a llama. This is kind of cool. This was donated uh, by a gentleman who lives in the area. He found it in a cave uh, years and years ago. This is what they call a boot pistol from about 1850s, 1860s, right around that time period there. So they, of course, the guy would carry it in his boot in there. It's a boot pistol. Yes. Here's some musket balls there. This would have been from about the first Seminole War area uh, era, about 1818, maybe a little bit uh, prior to that. 
1818, Andrew Jackson, as a general in the first Seminole War, came into this area and um, basically confronting the hostile Creek Indians. And uh, he was, when he came through this area, he was on his way to Pensacola to overthrow the Spanish government and take control of Florida. Essentially, what was going on there. But uh, these would have been from that time period, possibly from his guys, maybe not. And uh, his militia were essentially the first settlers along the Chipola River. So, I mean, it's back in Civil War era bullet, and these smaller things I won't pass any more this around. We're getting short on time, but afterwards, you're welcome to come by and take a look at any of this stuff. This is a gun flint from the flintlock musket that would have uh, fired that, so essentially there would have been a firing mechanism on that. And this is a flint, same as the artifacts we saw there. And it would be pulled back and it would strike um, a little piece of metal there, and it would throw a spark onto a little pan that held gunpowder, which would then uh, propel, uh, would ignite the gunpowder behind the bullet and send it out. So this would have been used along with this, as that would have went together. Let's see, let's put on the home stretch here. I'll send cool for last there. I thought this was neat. I, I found this um, years ago. This is a bird's eye peppers there. What's neat about it is the bottle that these peppers are in, they stopped manufacturing in about 1945 there. So these peppers were put up in vinegar to preserve them prior to that time. It came from an area uh, that had license plates that dated from the early 1940s there. So I just got I thought it was neat, and it's never been open. They're still sealed. I thought that was unique. Uh, no toothache bottle there. And these little blue bottles are pretty cool there. It's medicine of some sort. All right. One last thing, and then we'll have an opportunity for questions, and you're welcome to come up here and check out some stuff. Anybody want to guess what this is? It came out of the Chipola River. This is a harpoon, probably for alligators. There. Now this would have had a wooden handle in it, and this chain would have been on either a longer chain or a rope, and this pole would have been designed to slide out of this. So basically what would happen, you see it's got the barb on it. That's right, show them how like that. Hey, you want to hold until I let you walk around. Let's not pass it around, just walk up and down and look at it. And it would have had a wooden handle, and they would have stabbed the alligator or the big fish or whatever it was designed for, and they most like an alligator, and then the wooden handle part would have pulled out, and then they would just held on with uh, the chain or the rope there. So that's probably a 150-year-old alligator harpoon. I'm not sure. Well, uh, covered a lot of material. Uh, does anyone have any questions about anything that we've talked about? No? All right. Well... If anyone has any questions, this is going to wrap us up and I uh, hope it's been an educational experience for you and you've learned something about the natural and cultural resources of the Florida Cavern State Park. And uh, we'll wrap it up now. They say you're more than welcome to come up here and check out anything we got on the table. Thank you. The artifacts are not, uh, the artifacts themselves are used uh, for this type of program. The skulls are part of the nature exhibit that's in the museum that's offered. So if you were just to go in there basically this afternoon, you wouldn't see these things. There are exhibits. There is an exhibit of Native American artifacts. Uh, there are uh, exhibits of wildlife. So there are exhibits in there, but they're inside glass cases there, and we have a revolving uh, exhibit that's maybe four by four feet that we rotate some of these items out because these things that they were just left out you know they get stepped on or dropped or whatever and so this is uh, basically this half is part of the nature program that we have volunteers that bring this out of boxes and put it on display for school groups that come in they have somewhere around 10,000 children a year experienced this portion of the exhibit. And this, uh, we pulled out of that wooden box, they were called Box of Tricks, basically. And it's, a, it's just a history program. So you kind of got uh, a portion of two different programs put into one as a resource management program to show you the natural and the cultural side. So to answer your question, 
Uh, these are basically just two programs you wouldn't see all of the time, but they're offered for school groups and by request. Thank you. All right. So if anyone wanted to study this particular area, um, it, would be, it would be zoology, interpretive zoology. Mm -hmm. It's kind of a lot of different areas, really. You you got a lot of different ologies going on here. Um, you got uh, herpetology, ornithology, uh, ichthyology, entomology, uh, dendrology, archaeology, paleontology. So there's a lot of ologies going on here. So probably has a little bit from about eight or ten different ologies here. Uh, in general, uh, as a park ranger, this is what we call uh, interpretation. It's education through hands-on experiences, basically. It's, uh, we, we do interpret programs at the park. Uh, the cave tour is a, it's a big one. We have about uh, 80,000 people a year that come through the park for the cave tours. And then we do several other types of tours and programs. So, uh, the question was, if you were to study, want to study this kind of stuff, what would it be? It's a little bit of a lot of different things. It really is. Um, as, as a park ranger, you, you, you're kind of expected to know a lot of, a lot of things, a little bit about everything. Uh, we like to joke that we, you know, we wear a lot of hats. You know, we get, um, just in one day we have people come up and ask us, what's the weather going to be tomorrow? You know, uh, uh, I've got a, a water leak on my campsite. Um, I need help fixing the flat tire on my vehicle. My car's making a, a funny noise there. Um, what about that fire down the road? What caused that? When is it going to go out? You know, if, if we go anywhere in uniform, you know, we're asked everything from people who mistake us from correction officers to FWC to forestry. I mean, we, we wear a lot of hats and cover a lot of different areas. I think that the longer that you're a park ranger, the more of these different areas you pick up from questions you're asked and research that you do there. Uh, but I think. Um, if you were to become a park ranger, you would probably, you know, learn a little bit as you go, and your program would get bigger and bigger as you learn more about it. Being unique to this area, though, um, you'd say too that um, there's so much there that we have that that we don't find anywhere else. Would you say? Um, yeah, yeah. For the for the most part. Uh, at the park plant-wise, we have about 650 plant species, and somewhere around 40, 45 of those are listed species, either uh, threatened or endangered or something like that. Uh, we have a couple of plants that are not found anywhere else except for around the park there. Um, I try not to bring much of rare things. I want to encourage people to be out, you know, collecting and gathering things that are uh, that are they're not supposed to. This would probably be the only thing that I've brought today that would be uh, animal wise, it would be rare as a Swarney River turtle there. Uh, the artifacts, I mean, you, you're not allowed to take anything from, from uh, state land, and to remove artifacts from state land in Florida is a felony there. So uh, I would say it's probably protected in that capacity for sure. But uh, yeah, we, we do have uh, rare plants here that aren't found uh, most anywhere else. We've got some rare animals. Uh, in the park, we have the Sherman's fox squirrel there, which is a rare species. We have the, um, the Swanee River turtle, which is a rare species. The endangered gray bat only has about five or six caves that are known in the southeast that it uses for hibernation, and we have a couple of those. So, so to answer your question, that's a few of the things that we talked about today that aren't found really anywhere else. Any other questions?